Nobody personified Las Vegas in the 1950s better than Mo Dalitz and Wilbur Clark. Clark is remembered as an effective manager and congenial host who worked for years as a mob front at casinos such as the Northern Club, El Rancho Vegas, and the Desert Inn. Dalitz is remembered fondly as a Las Vegas icon who insisted on plush casinos, local building and expansion, including Sunrise Hospital, and charity work. Wilbur Clark arrived in Las Vegas in the early 1940s and started building his dream casino in 47. Dalitz bailed him out when things went bad, just as they were always designed to do. Suppose you haven't been to Ohio recently. In that case, you don't know Jack, the first new legal casino to open at 100 Public Square in Cleveland in 2013. Originally called Horseshoe Casino Cleveland, they billed it as the state of Ohio's first casino. Please. Sure, it's legal, but from the 20s through the 60s, there were more illegal casinos in Ohio than legal ones in Nevada. Many were owned by old bootleggers who got rich during Prohibition. Many involved Mo Dalitz and his Cleveland Syndicate. Morris Barney Dalitz was born on Christmas Day in 1899 in Boston, Massachusetts. After moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan, his family ran a series of laundries. It wasn't glitzy and glamorous. It was hot, sticky, and the chemicals smelled terrible. Dalitz attributed his later chronic congestion and high blood pressure to the work conditions. Or maybe he meant those he encountered running booze with the Little Jewish Navy in Detroit's Purple Gang. Who knows? What we do know is that Detroit is conveniently located on the shores of Lake Erie, a short skiff ride away from Windsor, Canada, where Canadian liquor flowed freely during Prohibition. You know what other towns are found along Lake Erie? That's right, the Ohio Big East, Toledo, and Cleveland. Yeah, after Dalitz took over the family cleaners, he took the U.S. government to the cleaners with boatloads of booze from Canada delivered in his new fleet of laundry trucks. Whoosh! A fortune. Ohioans were a rough and tumble lot. There were some blue bloods, but towns were full of factories and mills. At a place like Steubenville, everyone worked hard, and the conditions weren't very clean. They weren't fun. Rat Pack crooner Dean Martin and Jimmy the Greek Snyder were born there. Dean Martin recalls working as a roulette dealer in Steubenville casinos, and Snyder was a sports columnist with his own TV show in the 1970s. So even if it was a tough place to live, it was a good place to be from, just as so many pit bosses wound up in Las Vegas saying they were from Steubenville. Mo Dalitz met Jimmy Hoffa prior to his becoming president of the Teamsters Union and used his expertise in a $25,000 payment to avoid strikes at his laundries. Then he took the profits to legitimate businesses like Reliance Steel, Detroit Steel, Milko Sales, and the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad. Then Dalitz took an interest in all cash businesses like cigarette vending machines, jukeboxes and pinball games, slot machines. When his competition in Cleveland complained, they died. Cash was king. Local sheriffs were indifferent to stopping gaming, especially when it brought weekly envelopes filled with cash. Casinos appeared in Steubenville, Toledo, Akron, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and many smaller towns. Big town casinos had two and three door entrances built like jails with man traps. In Lucas County, you could play at the Academy Club, Chesterfield Club, Victory Club, or maybe that new place along the highway from Detroit, 50 miles away called the Club Devon. Free prime steak dinners, free booze, free cigarettes and cigars, 20 crap tables, 25 blackjack tables, room for a thousand players and all air conditioned. Millions of dollars in income paid for judges, politicians, and gang murders. <laughs> the clubs Mo Dalitz and his top men, Morris Kleinman, Sam Tucker, and Thomas McGinty, ran included the Mound Club, Pettibone Club, Beverly Hills Club, and then there was the Jungle Inn with 30 tables and 150 slots, the Lookout, the Hollywood, the Colony Club. The list went on and on. Some clubs were on the square. Others, like the Arrowhead Inn, had crews of dealers dealing seconds and moving crooked dice into the crap games. They considered it a standard good business practice. 
As early as 1939, notes from FBI special agents to J. Edgar Hoover extolled the virtues of the casinos and the enormous money Daylitz and his partners were making. Nobody stopped them. By then, Daylitz had met Paul Dorfman in Chicago, who helped Hoffa get the Teamsters presidency, and he'd met the Chicago Outfit bosses. In 1942, Daylitz joined the U.S. Army, rising from private to second Louis before the war ended. His days in Cleveland were no less dangerous, where skirmishes between gangs left 18 dead in a single year before Alfred Polizzi took control of Cleveland. Then he got popped for income tax evasion in 44, and John Scalise took the reins. Scalise maintained a strong relationship with Meyer Lansky and the Chicago Outfit and the New York Genovese crime family. To that end, he reigned for over 30 years. Mo kept his local businesses running, but took more interest in Las Vegas, especially after mob front Wilbur Clark broke ground on a new casino on the Strip and subsequently ran short of cash. Although the FBI knew Daylitz was an illegal casino owner in Ohio, Kentucky, and took profits from partners like Thomas McGinty in Carter's Casino, Florida, and a racetrack in New Orleans, the state of Nevada had no problems with Wilbur Clark fronting the Desert Inn and his Cleveland associate buddies putting up $3 million to finish the build. There may have been a piece set aside for Tony Accardo in Chicago with amazing dividends. Sam Giancana wanted 2% the same piece he personally got at the Flamingo. When the DI opened, it made an immediate splash. Wilbur had pilfered a high rollers list from the El Rancho when he left, and away they went. Hollywood starlets in the casino and in the showroom included Edgar Bergen, Abbott and Costello, and even Frank Sinatra making his Las Vegas debut in 1951. When the Daylitz group funded the Desert Inn, they cut back on their Cleveland operations. Still, they contributed skimming profits to the Cleveland family for mob protection and helped support the city's illegal gaming, bookmaking, loan sharking, and labor rackets in northern Ohio. As the Desert Inn Casino grew, a beautiful 18-hole golf course was added, leading to the Tournament of Champions PGA Golf event. Mo was in the background. Clark was the name and face of the property. He plastered his smiling mug on chips, brochures, and flyers while owning 17%. The Daylitz Group held 53%. McGinty, still a Mayfield Road gang affiliate, took 7%. In the mid-1950s, Tony Canero took his final swing at opening his own Las Vegas casino. He wound up with a hit, but died while shooting craps, in somewhat mysterious circumstances, at the Desert Inc. before the Stardust dreams were realized. Along the way, Daylitz brought in partners from Chicago, including frontman Jake the Barber Factor, who paid heavily and lost his interest to Tony Accardo and Sam Giancana when Daylitz pulled a switch on him. He was forced to lease the casino to United Hotel Corp. for just $100,000 monthly. Cornero had been set to get over a half a million. The Chicago outfit brought in John Drew and Lester Killer Kane Cruz to run the show. Mo Daylitz's old friend Jimmy Hoffa tapped the Teamsters Union for millions in loans to finish the Stardust, and by 1962 it was the biggest earner in Nevada, even with the skim set at 30%. By then, Daylitz, Kleiman, and Tucker held 66%. John Drew had 5%, as did Wilbur Clark and Thomas McGinty. Jake Factor held zero. Marshall Caifano, the Chicago Muscle Front, with at least a half a dozen murder torches to his name, made sure there were no arguments. Things ran great. After Daylitz sold the Desert Inn to Howard Hughes in 1967, he continued to contribute heavily to Las Vegas charities. He and partners like Allard Rowan and Erwin Molaski continued using Teamster loans for projects like La Costa in Carlsbad, California, a perfectly legal system at the time. The bribes to get the loans were not so legal. In 1980, Daylitz opened the Sundance Casino along Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas. It later became Fitzgerald's and is now the D Hotel. Mo Daylitz passed away August 31, 1989, leaving family and friends and a casino legacy stretching from Ohio and Kentucky all the way to Las Vegas. I miss the clarity of his ownership. 
Thanks very much for watching Nevada Gaming History's look at Mo Dalitz from Cleveland to Las Vegas. If you'd like to read more about their trials and tribulations, check out Vegas and the Mob at Amazon. And we've got more stories at www.nevadagaminghistory.com. Thanks again.